All right. Well, let's begin. Thanks. Uh, if you're uh, joining us now or if you're listening to this recorded, uh, we thought we'd put together a little presentation, help you evaluate some of the new meeting tools out there, um, approve your meetings, um, take a look at some of the hardware um, from both Intel and other providers out there uh, that are kind of helping us in our collaborative efforts these days. Um, evaluate some of the changes that have happened um, in the last year or so, or in the last uh, six, seven months especially. Um, just a little bit about us at Now Micro. So Now Micro is a life cycle uh, device management, device life cycle management company. Uh, we partner with some of the largest uh, industry providers out there, Intel, HP, Dell, Lenovo. Um, the nice Now Micro story kind of boils down to helping you with every facet and every piece of the cycle of your procurement to deployment, managing your devices and safely retiring them, uh, making sure each one of those facets are covered. Uh, we help you along the way and uh, that we can do it all eff effectively and get you the best value for your money. A little bit about me. Um, I'm Tim Davis. I've been with Now Micro for about three years. Um, I'm the subject matter, matter expert on all things Office 365 and adjacent cloud technologies. I have my Microsoft uh, Associate Certification Security Administration, soon to be expert level, hopefully, if I pass. <laughs> um, MC Associate level and certified in Office 365. And then I have my expert level certification and productivity, which uh, expands, expands to messaging, exchange, emailing, um, as well as Teams and the other productivity apps. Um, you may recognize me also from the Minnesota M365 user group board, um, which we meet every month um, virtually this year. So check out uh, M365, uh, mnn365.org. You can follow me at Twitter at, at breaking underscore bald or at office365mn. Um, is the user group Twitter handle. So if you're wondering about events for that, look us up there. We always post information about our speakers for the following month there. And then Bernard. Howdy, uh, Bernard Carter. I am uh, the Vice President of Technology for Now Micro. Um, just a little bit about my background. I have an IT infrastructure and development background, um, but prior to coming to Now Micro as a security architect, um, primarily focused on client embedded and uh, vendor security. So at Now Micro, um, I really focus on delivering solutions um, and to, again, use the word focus on automation, manageability, and security. So it's really about, uh, you know, the total package of what we're delivering, not so much the speeds and feeds and here's a box and have fun. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at Spring Failings. All right, thanks Bernard. So what we want to talk a little bit about today is some things that have been changes in the making for a decade and how the earlier this year and the events earlier this year have sped those changes along. Um, here we see kind of that typical old school security paradigm where your network perimeter was basically your trust barrier. Um, Allowing things inside your network perimeter um, was trusted and outside was typically a non-trusted machine, no matter where it was coming from. Um, unless, of course, it was connecting through a VPN tunnel. Uh, this is a very clean solution. Um, a lot of people still um, try to achieve something similar to this today. Um, but as we have seen um, over the past decade, we have a lot more cloud solutions, a lot more devices, cloud solutions, a lot more locations that our end users are working from, both offices, from their home. Uh, we still have a bit of that network perimeter going on, but we also have a variety of different devices, whether that be uh, laptops, mobile devices, and the introduction of edge devices. They may be gathering analytics. They may be providing information for us on a fleet, something to that effect. 
and then also a lot of external collaboration with people outside of our organization. So as we kind of process all this going into 2020, people are making those slow inroads to adjusting to a new identity and a new remote working paradigm. Uh, we got thrown a curveball at the beginning of this year, which sped up the process. Um, even this looks relatively clean, but um, all of a sudden a lot of organizations found themselves at the beginning of 2020 where things look a lot more like this. Um, all of a sudden our internal clients inside our network are disappearing. Uh, very few or far less people are coming into the office and performing any tasks from inside that network perimeter. Uh, a lot of our apps and resources are being moved to the cloud. Um, devices um, struggle to get more devices and devices that work. People wanting to work on devices that fit them or devices they already own as well as the introduction of a lot more IoT and edge devices. You can see kind of our network perimeter is dissolved. Um, it's kind of made remote working in the in the new security paradigm a, a lot more challenging for the IT decision maker and the IT admin. We really have to look at how we manage these devices, how we manage both the devices we own and the devices that our users want to work on, how we provide them services, not only to do um, internal workflows, but how do we allow them to collaborate? How will we allow them to communicate? And how do we enable those workflows as uh, we change the way we do a lot of the things in our everyday jobs? So a lot of those changes uh, we had to see is what, what do we rapidly adjust to at the beginning of this year? Um, we had to figure out how do we enable our increasingly remote workforce? Uh, what tools are going to be best fitted to do our jobs remotely? How do we make sure that we not only communicate with our users and make sure there's internal collaboration, but how do we also maintain that presence of communication with our clients? Uh, what does that look like? Um, if we can't have somebody over to the office every other day to work on a project, how do we get these things done if somebody is in Edina and somebody else is in St. Paul? Um, how do we measure how all these things are working? I mean, if we deploy a tool, what are the performance indicators we can look at that will actually indicate that some of these tools are being used? Um, how do we make sure everything we're doing is both secure and compliant? Our data is safe. Um, our customer and client data is safe and it's all in the appropriate spot and categorized. And uh, what changes to our infrastructure based on the shift in our in our security paradigms and our network paradigms, what do we have to do to make sure that our infrastructure is up to snuff and can handle all of these changes? And how do we stay connected? I mean, how do we stay together um, and be, still be a team when we don't see as much as of each other as we used to? Um, that was as simple as a happy hour before, but now uh, it uh, certainly a little bit different. Um, the trends we we've been seeing with our clients are, are pretty important. Um, fortunate to work with a lot of uh, really great clients, um, especially early in this year as some of the shuffle was going on, um, hearing their needs and then expanding out until as the summer went on and as we move into fall here, learning how those needs have changed, learning how those needs, um, how they've adopted and where were the missteps? What things did they do correct? What things do they like? What didn't they like? Um, one of those things would be moving more workloads to the cloud workloads to data and cloud services. Uh, for example, one of the heaviest lifts was Exchange Online for uh, for a long time. Uh, I can imagine a lot of people still running Exchange on premise right now. Some of the larger seat organizations that if they had to rely on VPN for all their Outlook clients to connect back to an on prem Exchange service. Uh, that wouldn't be very feasible. They'd be looking at upgrades in um, load balancers and firewalls just to make that happen at the moment. Um, so moving some of those workloads out to cloud data services enables us to shift a lot of those resources off of our infrastructure and allow those workloads to take place in the cloud. Uh, responding to new device requirements for remote workforce. Uh, what tools do people need from a device standpoint and a hardware standpoint? Uh, to make sure that people can hear and see them, um, that we can collaborate effectively. How do we 
how do we meet? How do we talk? How do we engage our clients? Uh, which leads us to conferencing solutions, for example, Skype, Teams, Zoom, um, just the enablement of remote meetings, uh, persistent chat and collaboration tools. Obviously, uh, was a huge popular or they were popularized far before uh, the events of 2020, but it it's kicked it into high gear. Uh, some using some of those tools for collaboration are really our only choice right now in some situations, which has kind of led us to realize that hey, there's some value here even in normal times. Um, responding to new analytics to monitor KPIs, uh, for example, usage an analytics from M365, productivity scoring, uh, monitoring software, see how our remote workers are working, what are they using, what are we getting a return on investment on, and then reworking and looking at some of our internal and network infrastructure to make sure that we're not backhauling any traffic, that we're being as most efficient as possible, and then staying connected through things like virtual events, um, having contests, or I'm sure uh, most people out there are having a, a virtual happy hour. We have one every Friday. Um, right. So how do we look for, how do we decide and define the tools? I mean, basically, we can break down tools into three different categories. Now, there's obviously a lot of overlap here. Um, a lot of the tools that we're going to evaluate will do multiple things in these categories, but I think it's important that we make a distinction in these functionalities because they are ultimately different things and they all do ultimately serve different purposes. Uh, for example, conferencing and meeting solutions. Uh, which generally includes something like dial-in conferencing, so people that aren't necessarily on our platform can still connect. Uh, screen sharing, so we can present and share um, either documents or presentations like we're doing now. Uh, meeting chat, so we can communicate outside uh, verbal context or share documents or files within that. And then presentation mode, um, so we can get information that's well assembled and convey that to our internal staff, internal groups, or even our clients. Um, I break off the next section between conferencing meeting tools into collaboration tools. And the big distinction there is a collaboration tool um, is something we work on over time. Uh, we use this every day to actually get the nuts and bolts of a project done or get the workloads done to assist us in making documents together. Uh, features of a typical collaboration tool Persistent chat like you'd see in, in Slack or Teams or Google Rooms. Uh, integrated file shares so we can share our documents, have a dedicated repository for files that apply to a certain project, a certain team, a certain business unit. And then uh, document and file co-authoring um, may not necessarily be a possibility for two people to sit down at a computer next to each other and work on a power pre PowerPoint presentation together or analyze the data, or parse the data out that's in an Excel spreadsheet. Now we can actually take a look at those with uh, Google or Teams together and break those down together while we're still apart. Um, shared notes is a huge factor in collaboration tools. Uh, do we have some place to put down brainstorming ideas, make lists, make tables? where we can document our ideas or even plan. And then shared applications within the collab wrapper. So for example, can we integrate apps that we're already using uh, for other workloads into our collaboration tool? For example, uh, adding a custom app that we may have developed into a Teams channel or a link into a Google room. So people have that link up and ready for them trying to provide that single pane of glass for everything that somebody is doing or everything people are doing in a certain team or in a certain business unit. And then whiteboard persistence. Can we can we whiteboard effectively as a team and then have that whiteboard data be saved? Can we harvest it later? Because I don't I don't know about you, but I've been in plenty of meetings where we've solved the whole world's problems on a whiteboard. Um, only to walk away from it in five minutes, nobody in the room remembers what we talked about. 
Um, so having some of that, being able to capture recordings and data uh, for what we discuss in meetings is a huge feature of a collaboration tool. And of course, PSTN calling services. So Cloud PBX, being able to place calls over the PSTN network, um, talking about uh, soft phones and or hard phones, as well as voicemail hunt groups. Um, more and more people are looking for a way to move these solutions to the cloud rather than house them inside their network perimeter uh, for a multitude of reasons. One, they may be quite taxing on the internal network. Um, they also might have compliance boundaries that we may need to be aware of. Um, and also it might just be cheaper to manage and cheaper to run a cloud PBX solution versus having our own solution on premise. Right. So if we take a look at uh, what we should consider when we're looking at any of these tools, conferencing or collaboration, uh, we probably want to take a good look at, our, at what our ecosystem looks like right now. Uh, what are you already leveraging? Um, are you using Microsoft Office? Are you using um, SharePoint, OneDrive, Microsoft Exchange, or are you in a Google Shop? Are you using Gmail and Google Docs for your collaboration? Um, that obviously is going to play in a lot into what you might decide to choose as a tool or as you're evaluating a current tool. Um, how will the tool be used is another big one. If you can identify usage scenarios, it's a great way to to leverage that consideration into looking at, at specific tools and evaluating them. Uh, who will be using the tool is another one. What business units will be using it? Do you have a subset of users that won't be using it? Or is this something that's going to be leveraged across the entire company? Uh, pricing, pricing and licensing obviously is, is going to play into it. Um, how is it. How much is it going to cost? And when we talk about pricing and licensing costs, we're not necessarily talking about the price tag the vendor gives you in an Excel spreadsheet saying if you buy 300 licenses, this is the price per license. We want to go further than that. What is the total cost of the licensing? Not only um, if we're managing it, what is it going to cost on our end to manage it? Um, what is it? What are, might we be able to sunset as a result of purchasing this tool? So maybe we have one tool that allows us to retire or reduce the usage of three other tools. So the opportunity cost there is something we have to analyze. Is it something we, it makes sense to, even though the price is a little bit higher than what we're already paying, does it pr allow us to reduce our cost in six months or nine months or a year? And do we already have licensing to some extent? Uh, this is pretty typical with, with Google or Microsoft's offer, offerings where if you purchase some part of M365 or Google licensing, you may already have licensing to leverage something like Teams or Google Rooms. So look at what you have available for you and possibly uh, you could take out and maybe do a pilot or test run of some of these tools to evaluate them without any additional cost. And uh, of course your culture and your organization, which uh, it varies differently from organization to organization. Um, what I'm talking about there is mostly familiarity with familiarity with certain tools are they using similar tools currently what is it going to take to manage these tools and train people in these tools in your organization and your willingness to adopt new tools or your users willingness to adopt new tools um, are they familiar with training and communications are they typically used to changes or is there a lot of resistance and that's something um, that changes and really we have to own as as decision makers or admins how we change that culture, how we help our end users, how we make sure we're enabling them and not just giving them something and say, here you go. We want to be excited. We want to evangelize. Uh, we want to train. We want to communicate and make sure when we do introduce a new tool or even new hardware uh, that people have the knowledge that they need to use those things. All right, if we take a look here, I've kind of done a slight comparison between some of the conferencing solutions that we see out there. Um, these are ones that we, we might typically come across in the wild. Obviously, there's others, but um, we're talking about the kind of the top five here. And this is more 
the slide's more taking a look at conferencing solutions as opposed to collaboration tools. Um, so if we take a look at, can you evaluate, um, can you evaluate these tools for free? Um, yes, all of them offer some type of free version or free trial. Um, so it's something you can evaluate to a certain extent. Um, these numbers are constantly changing. There's a race right now to see how many people you can cram into a meeting, <laughs> into a uh, into a virtual meeting right now. Um, Teams, is, I think actually Zoom is far more than 100 right now. So, but it is something we have to consider is um, do we need does our organization need to support meetings that are over 250 people, over 300 people? Um, do we have to have a separate tool when we do a live event or can we leverage something like Teams live events or is a Zoom meeting appropriate? Um, screen sharing, all of them obviously is a pretty common thing is um, can we share a screen? Can we present documents? Can we present information? Uh, whiteboarding, we can see Zoom and Teams are up there. I believe Google's working on something, and but I'm not sure about that yet. Uh, meeting recording, this is a huge one as well. Uh, the option to record the meetings is out there on all five of the tools. End-to-end uh, -end encryption. So Skype and Cisco are the only ones offering this. And when we refer to end-to-end -end encryption, we're talking about um, the only people with the keys to our data that is being transmitted via chat or meeting are the presenter and the recipients. So if we go to WebEx and we say, uh, we, want, we want all these meeting data, they say, well, that's too bad. We, we don't have the key. You have it and your recipients have it, but we can't actually, we can just see that there is data. We can't tell what it is, uh, but there are optional extras in both of those. Not typically an ask um, of collaboration or conferencing solutions, but it's something to evaluate as well if it is a need for compliance reasons in your organization. And uh, plans, obviously, plans per month. So pricing per month is obviously going to vary for all these options. Um, Zoom is typically $15 per user per month. Um, that's going to vary with the amount of seats and your vendors. You're definitely going to want to check with your licensing vendors. Uh, Microsoft Teams, um, if you were to just do an ad hoc Microsoft Teams plan for an enterprise, you'd be looking at roughly $5 uh, per user per month. However, it's typically bundled almost for free with some of the O365 and M365 plans that we see out there. Um, it may already be including that with license, included with license you already own. And if you're in the education space, you might want to take a look at uh, what that pricing is because it can be available for a reduced rate as well as Google may also be included in your licensing um, for enterprise you're looking at around roughly six dollars um, but you may end up having a situation where because of your EDU status or even government status uh, or the number of seats you're looking for it's much cheaper uh, Skype looking at around 299 that's consumer Skype not Skype for business uh, but the options in Skype are, are quite a bit more limited and Cisco WebEx being a little bit more expensive at around 1350 and all five offer a mobile application. So if we take a look, shifting from conferencing tools here to collaboration tools, um, we could take a look at some of the most popular ones. Now Google does offer, if we, if we remember what we talked about as far as a collaboration tool, the file sharing, persistent chat, app integration. Um, I've kind of broken down what each of these really popular services offer. We see Google Rooms offers a persistent chat solution. Uh, file share can be done with Google Drive. Um, Google Docs does offer co-authoring, so two people can work on a document at the same time. Um, Google Keep is their note solution. I'm not 100% sure if that's a collaborative thing, if we can actually co-author notes together in Google Keep yet, but they do offer a solution for note taking that's, that is actively being developed. And then app integration um, can be done through with support through third party apps like Zapier. Slack, um, more of just that persistent chat. Uh, we have Slack channels, both public and private, um, very good at organizing content within that chat format. Um, file sharing is done through channel attachments. There's not necessarily a repository unless you were to use a third party. Um, notes, there isn't necessarily a shared notes functionality within Slack. 
An app integration doesn't have native support, but problems with that could be solved through other third-party apps that I'm not aware of. And Teams, uh, persistent chat, very similar to, chat, uh, to Slack, where we have Teams channels, both public and private. Uh, file sharing and file collaboration comes from the back end, which is Office 365 groups. Um, each Microsoft team includes a SharePoint library for that dedicated team or channel. Um, document co-authoring is able to be done right within the team, so everybody can view those files and work on them at the same time. OneNote shared notebooks are available for each channel or team, and we can put our app there's pre-built app integrations for most of the most popular SaaS apps out there. However, even if we choose to develop our own app, there's a full development tools to develop our custom apps and embed them within Teams. So the biggest thing is, a point I really want to reiterate is, you can have all the tools in the world, but if you don't know how to use them, it's really not going to help you. So. Enabling your end users is much more than just giving them a shiny new present and saying, hey, um, here's your new hardware, here's your new software. We really want to drive, evangelize, and train our end users to be as efficient as we can. Um, evangel evangelizing is certainly something that gets overlooked. Um, we definitely want to be excited as decision makers and be excited as IT admins as much as we can. Um, that will that can be a huge shift in the way our end users view the decisions we make and view the tools that we provide. Now, if we take a look at after we've chosen a tool or service, um, just handing it to them, we also want to make sure that we have some of the hardware and video that we need for people to actually use these. So uh, if we take a look at video, is our the devices we have, the integrated cameras, we may have bought them five years ago. Are they really up to snuff for all of the new conferencing that we're doing? Can people really see us? Um, do we look fuzzy? Do Is the sensor quality high enough? Do we need to purchase standalone webcams or uh, discrete webcams that can be used to improve our video quality? Um, as well as multiple times, uh, I'm always struggling with the light quality in my office when I'm presenting to make sure people can see me. Um, is a presentation worthy for, say, if you're doing a live event for Now Micro, can people actually see you? Um, also, audio, can people hear you? Um, integrated microphones and speakers aren't always the best choice. Um, a lot of times, for example, you might want to choose something like a conference speaker or a headset. So you can both hear and be hear, heard clearly. Um, and do your users need to be mobile while conferencing? Is it something that they're typically in one place or they are in a fleet vehicles? How are they typically using the hardware and devices that you're providing for them? Trying to match that scenario with the best hardware and device that you can. And uh, you don't want to let your hardware be the, the weakest links. We can't necessarily prevent problems downstream or with the services if they have issues, but we can prevent problems that come up from outdated devices or legacy hardware. Um, and it's not easy to troubleshoot those midstream. So if we're if we can cover some of our bases beforehand, it'll reduce the issues that we have and reduce the issues that we have to troubleshoot as admins. So conferencing hardware and other purpose-built solutions um, both extend themselves to custom for conferencing and collaboration. Uh, maybe something you leverage for uh, internal collaboration or to present information and ideas to your clients. Um, typically, conferencing room hardware is, a, is dedic hardware dedicated to a specific space. So we have a particular meeting room, a particular area where we present quite a bit, much like where uh, Bernard is right now in our, our conference room. There are licensed solutions for Teams, Zooms, and even Google. For example, Zoom Rooms or the Microsoft Surface Hubs. Um, there are you, they're almost always audio and video solutions paired, and they may include whiteboards or touch screens for uh, whiteboarding or for idea placement or to visualize some of the ideas that you're talking about. And we can also talk about mobile and collaboration stations. So maybe a cheaper alternative to a dedicated room space 
um, and also maybe maybe more mobile. So we may be able to build a cart, for example, um, if you see on the left here, and Bernard will talk a little bit more about um, the cart we're developing here as well. Something we can move around and make any space a collaborative space. Any space can have hardware that is sufficient to present and to meet in and for everybody to be able to hear and see clearly. All right. So I think with that, I'm going to let Bernard take over on the next slide here. Howdy. <clears throat> I'm going to go into a little bit more depth on the some of the hardware, some hardware choices, um, show a little bit of hardware that's around me today, as well as give it, uh, you know, talk about how we actually manage and, and deal with this in all these disparate locations. So uh, to start, you know, Tim showed, you know, a number of pictures of pieces of hardware, you know, talked about why that's important. Um, I wanted to show that sort of on a spectrum, and this isn't exactly a linear spectrum, so it's a little, um, but I wanted to represent that, you know, when you're looking at your baseline solution that somebody is out in the field using, we're talking about integrated camera and microphone, right? In my, uh, like the laptop here that I'm presenting with, I'm not using this camera because it's a 720p camera and was chosen for its lightness and its ease of fitting in a bezel. So, um, you know, then we have the low light quality suffering. This has integrated mic and speaker, but, you know, maybe the echo canceling isn't as good as, um, you know, this external mic and speaker that I'm actually using to talk to you today. So in the setup here that I'm actually talking on, I have an external camera. It's actually a Logitech Brio, so it's a 4K camera. One thing you definitely notice as a difference between this and your typical laptop camera is the width of the field of view and the depth of the field of view. So we have a number of things that are sort of in focus, right, the depth of view, as well as this wide angle, um, I think about 120 degrees, where you can see me, you can see my laptop, you can see this mobile cart with, I think, Tim. I think that's still Tim. Hi, Tim. Um, and then over on the side, you can actually see um, our meeting room system in this conference room driven by a Lenovo device that's sort of off screen over here. So I also have my the presentation up over here. I can watch it as we go. Um, so it, uh, there you go, Tim. Uh, so if you talk about the spectrum, right, the next step would be the meeting room system, right? So sort of the bring your own device. Um, I'll dive into what that hardware looks like in some cases, but um, you know, typically you'd be looking at something like an Intel Nook here. Um, and I'll talk more about this device on the on the next slide. We get into the meeting room system. So I have this little tiny guy here. This is a Lenovo meeting room system that's basically just designed to be, oops, one slide back, Tim. Um, this is just designed to be, um, you know, a, a purpose-built uh, system for a small conference room. Um, in the conference room I'm in, there's some speakers, external camera, a Lenovo system. We have a Dell system across the hallway here in our larger training center. Um, you know, all the manufacturers have a solution and, uh, you know, can start as a BYD all the way up to meeting room system. And then I think at the top end, if you talk about sort of uh, maybe, you know, large scale webinars, um, executive meetings, board meetings, things like that, or, um, you know, where fidelity really might make a difference, especially in relationships, take a look at external um, mic and speakers. So there's a Logitech uh, meeting room system up here. This is um, actually connect. I'll, I'll go dive into the hardware and what's actually in it, but you know, essentially this is a high resolution pan tilt zoom camera that actually follows people in the room and focuses on them as they talk. So if I was, you know, gathered around a conference room table with a number of people, the remote actors could see who is talking exactly um, and be able to hear them, you know, just as if the, the mic was right in front of them. So uh, next slide, please. OK, so we talked about the bring your own device type system for a meeting room. Um, we, we're going to highlight um, Intel Nook here today. This is a 10th generation Nook uh, codenamed Frost Canyon. And um, this is a you know sort of really high performance small form vector. Um, this device itself actually has six cores in it. Um, I have one running as part of my demo that's actually about 20 miles away from here, and I'll show you some of the hardware that we put inside of it. But um, this also features uh, far field quad array microphones. So we talk about high quality external microphones. 
this device has them built in, including some, some noise cancellation features. This is also software agnostic. Um, most of the platforms certify um, you know, Intel NUC or Intel NUC-like devices for running on their platform. Uh, typical requirement would be you know, enough horsepower to be able to run things like noise cancellation, do the video work, the transcoding, whatever is necessary. Um, and all of this is packed in a little box that's also Visa mountable. So this is mountable sort of you know, on the back of a display. Um, it could be out front so the mics have you know, a clear view, um, but ends up being a pretty awesome little solution there. Next slide, please. Um, I also have a mobile cart solution here today. This is also built with an Intel NUC. Um, we've been working on this with um, a, a, a couple partners here for a little bit here. The idea here is that these challenges we're currently facing are driving form factors. Um, for example, this cart here is um, has my antimicrobial surfaces. You can wipe, this is actually a medical grade display that can be wiped and sanitized. Um, we're powering it with batteries. Um, this will last about nine hours of continuous usage um, over Wi-Fi, you know, powering the display, doing meetings, and has an integrated software stack. Um, we're actually running Zoom on this right now, but also can run Teams. Um, running Zoom on this, um, we get the full pan tilt uh, control as well. And then we're also, you know, have compl complete remote monitoring and management. Um, I think one of the challenges we see is if you have hardware spread out everywhere and you're trying to really enable this communication, those scenarios don't also lend themselves to also having people on site. So uh, in the case of mobile car solution, say this was in a nursing home or a hospital, a doctor's office, and enabled the communication between a patient and their family, maybe as they're in a hospital bed. Well, if something goes wrong with the system, you do want to be able to sort of troubleshoot, manage, um, control it, maybe know where it is remotely um, without having to some, somebody go to that room, because now somebody has to wheel it out, bring it to another area, fix it. We've disrupted that communication, um, maybe during a really critical time. And the, there's a lot of sensitivity to this. And I think these, this kind of thing is more important that it has the uptime. It's more important that people feel confident in the solution working when they need it. Go to the next slide, please. So you're know, talking about effective management, right? So all of these things end up having apps, drivers, and firmware. Um, even in the case of the Logitech camera up here, there's some firmware um, that you know adds features over time. Maybe you know the people tracking, people following, people counting gets improved. You're going to want to be able to deploy those firmware updates to those devices. In the case of like a BYOD device, maybe there is a reliability or uh, performance or power saving you know bundled with the firmware security updates bundle of firmware, you want to have a way to be able to deploy this stuff. You also need to be able to look at the apps and drivers on the system so that when there is a problem, you know, hey, this is an older version of the app. Let's get that updated. This is an older version of the driver. It has some known issues. Let's do this update and fix what we know is wrong first so that we can get to, you know, maybe this just fixes all the problems and we're, we're good to go, or hey, this needs a, you know, a deeper look. I think one of the other things that's becoming, uh, you know, it's been asked more and more is we basically in March took all the stuff that we had inside our buildings and shoved it out. And all that hardware went somewhere, but we don't know where. Um, even with on-prem solutions like a mobile cart um, or, you know, just, you know, people doing, you know, solutions like this out in the field, you kind of want to know where it is. Um, we still need to be good stewards of our assets our data, we need to know where assets that can you know, actually access our data are, um, you know, where you logged in, things like that. So a little bit of demo for that, for location awareness around a device. Um, and then talking about trust again, fast support. Um, if somebody knows they can call, get help right away, typically they drive to a resolution on that call and not just take on a ticket and have somebody call you back a week from now there will be a confidence in the ability of that group to deliver that technology. And that confidence lets people use the technology instead of worrying about the technology, right? We have enough worries in the world. Um, you really wanna be able to focus on using your tools, not managing your tools, right? So um, we drive that um, through a variety of things, but you really what you're looking for is a single pane of glass. Somebody calls, I can see what's going on. I can troubleshoot it. I can give some suggestions, fixes help them through that problem, and then hopefully complete that call. And now we had a good 
you know, there was a problem, but we got through it together, right? It's a good place to be. Next slide, please. Um, the way we drive a lot of that is with DICE. DICE is our single pane of glass that helps customers manage through product life cycles. Um, it's a portal and it's a portal that contains uh, all of Nell Micro right in front of you, including like order information, real-time device information, um, you know, information you could, we have organizations that use this as their asset manager um, or give it to help desk technicians in order to sort of drive their first call resolution. Um, and it's a, you know, standalone tool. Um, more information at nowmicro.com dice, but I think I have, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? I think we might be at demo time. Nope. Build from customer challenges. So you heard us talk about sort of how things have changed, um, you know, how we've, what we've heard from people and how they've been affected, um, how we see being able to at least help people focus on using tools instead of managing tools. Dice and all the stuff that we've been kind of talking about today, it was all built from customer challenges. Um, these customer challenges are typically fairly universal. People are overwhelmed by assets. Um, device warranty expiration is in six different places. How I see it in one place. I might have an asset management tool and then an old one we never got rid of, how, but I have to manage assets in both tools, or I have a, you know, maybe a large fixed asset tool thing and I have a, you know, computing device one. How do, how do I manage all this? How do I get historical information and manage devices in the field? So. We solve that with a number of, um, you know, flexible, easy to use interface, uh, servicing the information that you need when you need it, and then APIs uh, to get it, you know, deeply integrated into whatever you need it in the format you need it in your system. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna give a little bit of demo of this because um, that's what I like doing. So I'm gonna share. No micro dice. We should be able to see that now, correct? Good. Okay. So I'm actually looking at, um, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about this Nook system. It's a Nook 10 Frost Canyon device. I actually have one of these at my home office, um, about 20, 25 miles away from here. Um, and I have, uh, it's an Acme Corporation device. I'm using it as a conference room system at home. And I want to see what's going on. Maybe somebody calls me and tells me uh, their their camera's not working. So with Dice Live, um, there's a small agent on the system. We're pulling real time information, you know, roughly once an hour ish, and I can kind of get a pulse and see what's going on with this device. So I can see that it is a Nook 10 i7 FNK, which is exactly this system. I can see its serial number as a tag, and I can see what it was doing last time it checked in. So the CP utilization is really low with, with six cores and doing meeting room stuff. I'm guessing it probably is usually not doing much. Um, drive utilization looks good. Memory utilization looks really great. So let's keep on taking a look at this device here. Um, I can pull up some, some graphics information. So in the case of a conference room system, maybe the display resolution's wrong or I have an old device driver, I can sort of troubleshoot that here, see what's going on. Um, in this case, this is hooked up to a Dell display at my house and I can see the serial number of that display. So in the case of a conference room system, if somebody calls and says, I have a problem with my conference room system and you're trying to triage it, um, I can see if the display is connected or not. Because if the display is not showing up here, Either the display's off, or maybe the cable's bad, or the display's bad. But I know the system's working. The system I can contact, I can get to, I can see what it's thinking is happening. The system says it doesn't have a display. Well, let's let's look at the display type issues first. Then, can hey, can you unplug it, plug it back in? Can you hit that power button? Um, can you? Are you sure that light's green, not red? You know, have you tried turning it off and back on? Kind of kind of answers here. So. I'm able to sort of bisect that issue and get somewhere. Um, you know, memory information, network adapter information, we're getting MAC addresses, IP addresses, um, you know, whether or not it's a Wi Fi adapter. We actually are, um, can also see the associated SSID, but we're not displaying it currently. The next revision will. Um, I can get operating system version. So, one of the things in this case, this is running um, Windows 10 IoT Enterprise, 
which is an embedded um, uh, purpose-built focused version of Windows 10. But here I can see, uh, for example, if I was running 1909 uh, versus 2004 Windows 10, maybe I need a newer version of Windows 10. Um, you know, 1607 doesn't cut it right now. It's out of support. We need to get you upgraded to the new version. So Zoom or Teams starts working again. Um, basic processor information. We can see we have six physical cores, 12 logical cores. We actually are collecting all the software on the system as well as drivers. So getting back to, um, you know, the, the actual reported problem was the webcam. So let's see. I'm just going to search for cam, and I see this as a Microsoft Life Cam Cinema. It's an older 720p display, but it is connected last time I checked in. So I don't think the problems, the camera is not connected. Well, so we, we figured that out. Um, again, storage, system management type information um, as well. So in this case, I'm going to connect to it with, uh, I'm going to connect that system with Dice uh, Complete which is sort of the, the top tier of our dice thing, which gives me interactive management capabilities. So this device, I switch to the tab. Uh, you can see here, my clock says 149. Here's actually a, uh, that's an Alexa sitting on my desk at home. And we can see the, you know, the picture over it. This isn't a very good camera feed. It's not a very good camera, it turns out. I should probably be using the Logitech camera that's in front of me instead of this one at home. But I wanted to give a good webinar for you guys. Um, and we can see here that it's live right through this VLC window. So that's that's neat. So I think the camera is actually working and maybe this person just lies a lot. Um, you know, I'm gonna close the ticket and say, hey, it looks like it's, it looks like it's working now. So, but if I needed to, for example, uh, you know, update some drivers or install something, I could obviously click, you know, go to Chrome, download a driver, whatever I need to do. I could also connect to this device behind the scenes and, you know, restart a service. Um, you know, get the serial number of the device, whatever I need to do there. I also have file system access. So if somebody's reporting a problem and all I need is a log file, I don't need to have you go hunt and find that log file. I'm just going to go, uh, you know, maybe to program data, now micro logs and get the logs for the agent. I could, I could download that and see what's going on. So, um, you know, the power of this is really about uh, getting you to first call resolution, uh, being able to sort of remotely see what's going on, getting a pulse on the device, and then presenting it all on a single pane of glass with dice. Um, the last thing I want to show here is asset tracking. So this, I'm not going to show this system because it's sitting at my house and I don't want to dox myself today. But if we look at this device, this is a device that's checked in relatively recently, but it's a, it's a laptop in, in the back here. Um, and if I go to the asset tracking to lab, I am storing um, some locations here and I can get the location of this device. So DICE asset tracking only requires a Wi-Fi adapter be present in the system. So for example, these have a Wi-Fi adapter, even if it's connected with a wired interface, as long as there's a working Wi-Fi adapter, I can, um, I can get its location within you know, a confidence interval. In this case, they're saying, you know, 94, 90 ish feet most of the time. Realistically, it's actually closer to about 20 feet away from where it's showing on the map here. And I can see where that device was over time. So if there's questions about where that fleet is, where did that device end up? Um, maybe if in a building, where did that mobile cart go? I can now see that mobile cart's here, not, not over here. I, I actually have a place to go look. So I'm going to stop my sharing here so Tim can show his slides. All right. Let's present again. All right, next slide. All right. Can you hear me OK? We can. All right, awesome. So just wrapping it up. Um, Really happy today, all of you that joined us. So could, we could give you a little bit of overview of collaboration and device management. Um, infrastructure design needs to be considered where, what we need to do to make sure we're enabling remote work, conferencing, um, the whole picture as opposed to just a facet of it. A lot of times uh, with our clients, we end up engaging in just a slice of this pie, but looking at everything in the whole is, is a big deal. Um, as well as taking a little bit of look at what software is out out there, um, 
how you can evaluate and what you need to consider to find the right solution for your organization. And some of the cool things that uh, Bernard and his team are working on as far as uh, hardware and peripherals and what's out there and available, and really how can you manage it? Um, not only just give it to your end users, but train them and manage those devices so they can be effective. Right. And if you're uh, looking for additional URLs where you might want to uh, find some more information, uh, we're keeping a blog. I actually have a blog post that I should be posting within the week here. Uh, blog.nowmicro.com regarding some of this with a little bit more of a deep dive into some of the tools and some of the considerations around this as well as uh, uh, if you're more interested in the dice or just finding out more about now micro at a whole you can find us at nowmicro.com and I think that's about it if we have any questions or if anybody wants to ask me or Bernard anything regarding what we talked about Let's see, let's look at the Q&A area here and see if I see any. I do not see any open questions in the Q&A area. We answered them all. Hopefully we answered them all. You know, obviously reach out if you have any questions. I know we went through a lot of stuff in about an hour. Um, I didn't even talk about this document camera where you can like see, put documents under here and see what's going on. I'm sure I forgot a million other things. So if you have any questions about any of the form factors, weird stuff we've shown, uh, any of the jokes I made, uh, I didn't make very many jokes today, unfortunately, or, you know, how we did this, you know, more about the mobile card, feel free to contact us and, uh, you know, we'll probably, sh you know, shove the email to somebody else, but eventually we'll help you. So this is my quote of the day. We want to know what problems you have and we want to help you solve them. We want to make sure we, we, we are, uh, building solutions that will actually help you out. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you. And we'll also be posting this on YouTube, I believe, uh, you know, within a week after we do a little editing, so. All right.